So we're back once again with a yet another series that's going to explore basically the last of our major topics in this introduction to the Sanskrita language, the language of the gods. Now, in this series, we'll be talking about verbs and how verbs are formed in what's called the present indicative tense. Panini calls it the lat. Sanskrit verb conjugation can be a very complicated topic, I'm not going to lie, but actually it's really not all that hard of a topic. Now what I mean by that is that there are lots and lots of rules that you do have to learn to get things right, uh, and lots and lots of exceptions to the rules that you have to learn, but the basic idea of conjugating a verb is actually very simple, and believe it or not, we've already learned it. It all starts with verb roots, these dhatus, which get turned into stems, and to those stems you add either parasmaipada or atmanepada endings, which are like leaves and flowers on a plant. Remember, uh, these endings have to match the subject of the sentence, the noun that's going to be found in the nominative case, in the prathamavibhakti. Uh, and it has to match in terms of person and number, purusha and vachana in Sanskrit. Uh, that's actually it. That's the whole thing, the whole deal. These, this is the full idea behind what it means to conjugate a verb. Now, what makes the topic a tricky one and, and actually kind of a frustrating one when you're just starting is how you go about that first step, going from the verb root to the stem. And this is going to involve 10 different classes of verbs, each with their own set of rules about how the stem gets formed off of the verb root. And that's where it gets complicated and way more so than many other languages. But if we take our time with the classes, with these ganas as they're called, and if we go through them one at a time carefully, we'll be all right. Uh, the classes form what's called the present system, the lut. Uh, and to be precise, the, actually the lut refers to when you create the present stem from the verb root, and then you add the regular endings onto them, the ones we've already learnt, uh, these two different kinds of endings, the parasmaipada endings and the atmanipada endings. Parasmaipada endings, just to review, are going to be ti, si, mi, taha, taha, vaha, anti, tha, maha. Atmanipada endings are going to be te, se, e, then ete, ete, avahe, and then ante, dve, and amahe. That's the lut present stem plus regular endings. Besides the let, you're going to find a few other tenses that are part of this present system that we're dealing with. Uh, there's the simple past tense, which is called also called the imperfect. Uh, Barnini calls it the lung, and we're going to be learning about the lung uh, probably in our next set of videos. Two other tenses are formed off of the present sis, the present stem, uh, which one is the imperative, also known as the lot, and it's, this is what you use to give orders, to bark commands. Then there's uh, the optative or the ling, which is used to give out rules, suggestions, hopes, and wishes. Uh, we'll also learn about those two as part of our next series down the road. Uh, besides the present, uh, there are actually three other entire verb systems in the Sanskrit language. You'll be delighted to learn those probably next year. Uh, one of them is the future system, which is also known as the lrut. And then there's the perfect, known as the lit. This is another uh, second past tense in Sanskrit. Finally, there's even another past tense, a third past tense system called the aorist or the lung. Uh, it's a notoriously difficult one. But you don't have to worry about any of those just yet. They're fun, but they're down the road. Uh, let's, for now, just focus entirely on the present tense, the lut, and how to form it. Now, as I mentioned, there are 10 different classes of verbs, these ganas, uh, that are part of our present system. These ganas are further grouped into two different broad sets. One set of classes we call the uh ganas, and these all involve a characteristic class marker, a gana mar marker, that's going to involve the letter a, uh, the uh kara, during the formation of the stem. There's four of them. The classes are 1, 4, 6, and 10. Uh, they're relatively easier to learn and recognize than the others, and many, many common Sanskrit verbs are part of these four 
classes, these aganas. The other classes, two, three, five, seven, eight, and nine, these are known as the non-aganas. As the name suggests, they don't involve the addition of the letter a, uh, the agara, uh, in forming your stem. There's also further complications in these, which make them a lot harder to learn than the agarnas. And this is uh, these these classes exhibit what's called the strong weak alterna alternation of stems. This means that for each of the non agarna roots, there's going to be two different stems that it turns into. One of them is the strong stem, and the other is the weak stem. And it depends uh, which one you use depends on which ending you're using. The strong stems are used actually only for three different endings. The first person singular, the second person singular, and the third person singular in the Parasmaipada paradigm. These are the endings ti, si, and mi, basically. That's it. Those three take the strong stem. All the other endings, including the entirety of the Atmanepada paradigm, they're all going to use only the weak stems. So again, this is only in the non-agana uh, classes, two, three, five, seven, eight, and nine, where you're going to find this strong, weak alternation of stems. The aganas will only have one stem, uh, and it's used throughout all the paradigms. Okay, so with this in mind, let's now start diving into our ganas. Uh, these are the verb classes of the present system, the lat. We'll take each one on, one by one, and we'll learn how to form the stem for each of those classes. Uh, let's get to looking at it. We'll also then get to looking at a few of the basic verbs that are found in each of the classes, and we'll talk about some exceptions or oddities that you'll encounter along the way. There's one other thing I want to mention, which is that we're going to be talking a lot about gunation of vowels. So you should first take some time to review that video from way back when on the gunas and vridhis of vowels, in case you've forgotten it. Remember, the guna of a uh is a, uh, right? The guna of a uh is a. Uh. The guna of i e and e is a. The guna of u and u is o. The guna of r, r is r. And the guna of r is al. And that's it. Actually, that's the end of all you need to know for now. Uh, anyway, hope you enjoy the ride. And again, don't worry if you make mistakes. They're going to happen. You're going to make mistakes. I'm going to make mistakes. Let's just learn from our mistakes and keep sight of the bigger picture of how verbs are conjugated as we venture through the present system. So, see you next time. Thank you for watching. Punar milamaha and miladaha.